Draco Malfoy, and why in Merlin's name is it always scary? My Draco will hear about this. Chapter 7. A Long Time Coming. Draco quickly realized that he could do nothing but simply accept the fact that Harry and Weasley were back to being attached at the hip, no matter how much he thought Weasley did not deserve Harry's forgiveness. In Draco's eyes, he had betrayed Harry beyond redemption by doubting him when it mattered the most. He did not say anything to that effect in front of Harry. Naturally, his friend seemed so happy to have his ginger nuisance back that he did not have the heart to ruin things for him. But he made a point of not speaking to Weasley unless he absolutely had to, and it translated fairly well, it seemed. One time between classes, when Weasley and Draco were randomly left to their own devices by the other two, Harry had gone to the bathroom and Hermione had not yet returned from the library. Weasley tentatively tried to mend the abyss between them, only to have Draco shoot him down completely. Listen, Malfoy, Weasley said in a rather small voice, cutting through the tensed silence. Although I said some things when, you know. Eloquent as always, I see, Draco sniffed. Weasley let out a frustrated huff before starting again. What I mean to say is, I know I've not only been a git to Harry, but to you as well. I feel like I owe you an apology. Don't bother, Draco returned coolly. No, Weasley argued. I know you're still mad at me, and you probably have a right to be. That's right, I do, Draco cut him off. And nothing you can say will change that. If Harry wants to forgive you, that's up to him, and I won't meddle, so you don't need to worry about that. But I'm decidedly not as gracious and forgiving as he is, so I'd say we drop the subject now before I lose my temper with you. Weasley was frowning and staring at the floor, looking abashed and petulant at the same time. They fell back into their frosty silence until Harry returned, and they made their way down to care of magical creatures together, Harry chatting away happily between them, unaware of the insurmountable chasm between his two friends. Draco, however, was far more interested in the clue Harry's golden egg was supposed to give him for the next task, though Harry, quite to Draco's frustration, did not seem to share his interest. You have to let him figure it out by himself, Hermione sighed as Draco poured over a book for translation spells, trying to find one that might transform the screaming that started as soon as the egg was opened, which Draco suspected was some form of communication by the magical creature he had to face next, into simple English. It's in the rules, Draco. Screw the rules. Draco is not caring about his grudges in the slightest. Like hell, will I let Harry work on this alone? We'll be panicking in the library the night before the second task if we do that. No, Draco shook his head. I'll figure this out in time, even if Harry wants to laze around and not think about it for now. Hermione opened her mouth to respond, but abruptly closed it again, flushing a dark red color. Draco took in her expression with some confusion before following her gaze until he found Victor standing across the room. He had paused in his search for a book to catch Hermione's eyes and smile at her, but when he noticed Draco looking, he quickly returned to his task. Draco snorted and turned back to Hermione, grinning. Oh, he said gleefully, I see how it is. He asked me to go to the Yule Ball with him. Hermione whispered under her breath, eyes wide, as she stared at Draco. I'm not surprised to hear that. Draco shrugged. He's been interested in you for quite a while. I've been waiting for him to make a move. You knew, she demanded, and it isn't like to mention it to me. Excuse me, I'm not going to betray his trust. Draco rolled his eyes. Hermione only grumbled to herself, still flushed as dark as scarlet as her Gryffindor tie, and it amused Draco deeply. So, he prodded, what did you say? Well, Hermione muttered, gulping. I said yes. I mean, of course I said yes. It's extremely flattering after all, and he's nice, and... An international Quidditch star, Draco provided. A school champion. You know I don't care about that, she hissed. Still, Draco smirked. It doesn't hurt. You're having way too much fun with this, aren't you? She accused, glaring at him half heartedly. I'm just thinking about how Weasley will take this news, he said cheerfully. Hermione's face grew more serious at that, examining him closely before asking tentatively, You really won't forgive Ron already? Hermione, Draco groaned, glowering. Will you please drop it? It's just, she bit her lip, You were the one drafting the peace between the three of 
muscle last year. That was different. And what he did wasn't even directed against you. Hermione continued, ignoring his input. Don't you think it's up to Harry to decide whether or not to drop it? Do you see me interfering with Harry's decision? He demanded. Am I telling him what to do? No. So why are you trying to tell me what to do? I'm just saying, she insisted. If Harry can forgive him, and really this whole thing was between Harry and Ron in the first place. That's the thing, though, Draco interrupted. I can deal with it if he doesn't believe what I say, or judges me like my father's son or whatever. I'm used to that. But Harry? He took a sharp breath, his lips pursed as his gaze returned to the book in front of him. I won't forgive him for betraying Harry like that. For leaving him when Harry needed him most. How can we trust him not to do the same thing again when it matters? I think he learned his lesson, Hermione said tentatively. And I get what you mean, I really do. Harry is my friend too, after all. But I just think if Harry can forgive and forget, well, Harry is the bigger person out of the two of us, Draco snapped. Is that what you want to hear? Because I have no problem admitting it. Hermione sighed deeply. Sometimes I don't understand you, she muttered. All this thing you and Harry have going there. I get that he's important to you and that you're protective of him, but sometimes I feel like it overrides all reason. So what if it does? Draco hissed. I care about him. What's wrong with that? I care about him too, Hermione argued. It doesn't stop me from thinking rationally, though. Well, Draco returned, angrily slamming his book shut and getting to his feet. Maybe then you don't care as much as I do. He did not stick around to observe the effect those words had on Hermione, instead storming off, heading for his dormitory to spend the rest of his break there, away from insufferable Gryffindors. I'm sorry, Hermione said about an hour later when she sat down next to him for ancient ruins. I was out of line. So was I. Draco sighed. You just made me so angry. I know, Hermione admitted ruefully. You know how I am. I can be stubborn if I think someone is wrong about something. That's the understatement of the year, Draco noted, but he was smiling, and it took the bite off his words. I don't know why I even bothered, Hermione mused. You and Ron have never been friends exactly. You accept each other's existence, and that's that. There you go, Draco encouraged. Now you get it. I'll never be friends with Weasley, and the sooner you accept that, the better. I guess, she nodded, not looking too pleased with the prospect, but having at least the decency to drop the topic this time. So, she said, changing the subject, as Professor Bembling was still engaged in some discussion with Sui Lee and Padma Patil and made no moves to start class. Have you thought about who you want to take to the Yule Ball? Draco frowned, thrown by the question. Have you ever seen me show any interest in a girl? He replied. Besides you, I mean, and no offense, but I really don't see you the way Victor does. As if I didn't know that, she chuckled. And that feeling is entirely mutual, don't worry. But you don't exactly need to be interested in someone romantically to ask them to a party, do you? I don't think there's any girl at Hogwarts apart from you that I'd feel inclined to spend a whole evening with. Draco answered, making a face of the thought. Not to mention that I highly doubt anyone would want to go with me if I asked. To one half of the school, I'm the son of Lucius Malfoy, and to the other half, I'm a blood traitor. I think you're underestimating your own charm, Hermione argued. I'm pretty sure a lot of girls would actually be very flattered if you were to ask them. I know at least one who would say yes without thinking twice. Who? Draco frowned. Ginny? She said in an obvious attempt to be casual. Draco couldn't help it. He laughed. What's so funny about that? Hermione frowned. Ginny is a lovely girl. She is. She is. Draco agreed. Only she has a major crush on Harry and always had. Not as much as she used to have. Hermione pursed her lips. She's been almost as interested in you these days. Stop messing with me. I'm not. She protested, her voice indignant. I swear I'm not. You're her tragic hero act in second year, in addition to your rebellion against your father, has made quite an impression on her. And I'm sure she's not the only one seeing that. Be that as it may, Draco said, still chuckling. I'd much rather spend the Yule Ball hanging out with my friends instead of chatting up a girl. 
You do realize that Harry will need a date, Hermione frowned. He's one of the champions. He's expected to open the ball with a dance. Oh, Draco said, all humor leaving him abruptly. And you know Ron will want a date if Harry and I have one, Hermione continued. By the way, I'd appreciate it if you didn't mention to them that Victor asked me. I'd rather put that conversation on for as long as I can, but never mind that now. I just don't want you to feel left out when all of us end up coming with someone else. When Draco did not answer to any of that, she elbowed him, making him meet her eyes. Are you listening to me? I am, he confirmed, though his voice was rather subdued now. I'll think about it, okay? I really think you'd have a good time with Ginny, she insisted. She'd have a much better time with Harry, I'm sure. Draco muttered rather bitterly. Harry, don't ask her. Hermione shook her head. I have a feeling who he'll want to go with, and it's not Ginny. Who? Draco asked, feeling more sick by the minute. Cho Chang, she said simply. Have you not seen the way he looks at her? Indeed, Draco had not noticed. The thought of Harry having a crush on anyone made him feel strange, like snakes were wriggling their way through his intestines. Thankfully, Professor Babbling decided to finally start teaching, and Hermione had to drop the whole Yule Ball issue. The feeling of unrest it had brought over Draco did not leave him for the rest of the day, though. The next couple of weeks were filled with strange little events. For one, Rita Skeeter turned up at their Care of Magical Creatures class and scheduled an interview with Hagrid, which turned quite predictably into an interrogation about Harry that Hagrid refused to be part of. Another one was Hermione invading the kitchens in the name of S.P.E.W. and finding Dobby and Winky working down there, Dumbledore having agreed to pay Dobby a small sum each month as salary. Dobby was ecstatic to see both Harry and Draco again, chatting away happily, and Draco found himself quite fond of the elf now that he was out of the manor and not in any way connected to his father anymore. None of these things kept Draco's mind as occupied as the matter of the Yule Ball, though. It was ridiculous, really. He did not want to ask anyone to go with him, and he had other things to worry about, like that stupid egg which seemed resistant to any translation charm he tried on it. But still, his thoughts kept returning to that stupid event with a sense of impending doom. Harry was rather tight-lipped about who he wanted to take, though now that Hermione had pointed it out, he did catch Harry sneaking glances at the Ravenclaw table whenever he thought no one was looking. Every time Draco caught sight of it, he immediately lost his appetite. A number of girls had also taken matters into their own hands and asked Harry out themselves, but he had turned down all of them. Weasley, being the huge troll that he was, had a lot of opinions about which girls were suitable to go with and which weren't, driving Hermione up the wall with his superficial views, but Draco felt grimly comforted by the nonsense he was sprouting. Never in a million years would that guy get a date. Every girl agreeing to go out with him would have to strip herself of all pride and suffer to the blast ended scrooge for dinner. At least he'd not be the only one coming alone. Or that was what he'd thought until Christmas crawled closer and closer and the teachers had started decorating Hogwarts for the season. The two Gryffindor boys had grown more and more restless the more time passed, and Draco's tentative hope that none of them would end up finding a date was cruelly shattered the week before the actual event, when Harry told him in evident relief that he and Weasley were going to the ball with the Patil twins. What? Draco asked, trying to keep his voice even as his heart dropped through the floor and out on the other side of the globe. I did not know you were interested in any of them. I'm not really, Harry admitted. But, he hesitated for a moment, then continued, I asked Cho Chang, but she's going with Diggory. So, really... Harry trailed off, but Draco could hear the words he was not saying. As long as he could not go with the person he really wanted to go with, it didn't matter. I asked Parvati last night, and she agreed to ask Padma for Ron, so here we are. Draco did not say anything. He just stared straight ahead, trying to rein in the complicated emotions that were rising up inside of him, threatening to overwhelm him. Why did this bother him so much? Just because he didn't have anyone he wanted to go with didn't mean that his friends weren't allowed partners. He wasn't the kind of friend who wished for bad things to happen to his friends just because they were convenient to him. And Victor asking Hermione had not bothered him either. Why was Harry any different? 
He felt his friend's eyes on his face, and suddenly Harry was cursing. Crap, I'm sorry, he muttered. I should have asked for you as well. I just didn't think you never showed any interest in the Yule Ball, so... Don't worry about it, Draco shrugged. I'm not going. What? Harry blinked, staring at him. Why not? Because it's a stupid event full of giggling girls and older students trying to sneak in alcohol under the teacher's noses, and I don't want any part of it. Are... are you sure? Harry asked, taken aback by Draco's sudden contempt. Not that Draco could blame him. He hadn't shown any enthusiasm for attending, mind you, but he had never intended to not show his face at all. Now, though, with everyone else grouped up, he felt like he'd rather snog Morning Myrtle than watch Harry dance with Parvati Patil all night. Quite sure, Draco said rather stiffly. So you're not angry with me? Harry checked. Because you seem angry. I'm not, Draco confirmed. Now, if you'd excuse me, I have to go to the library because someone needs to figure out that stupid egg while you ponder what to wear or whatever. You are angry. Harry sighed. I'm sorry, Draco. I can still ask Pravati if she knows anyone else who might- Have you not been listening? Draco snapped. I'm not going! And I would appreciate it if you'd put some effort into that stupid egg once in a while so that you don't die in February! Okay. Harry nodded, holding up his hands in surrender. Okay, I'll figure something out. Yeah! Draco scoffed, rolling his eyes. Right! As if! And with that, he left Harry standing in the corridor, unable to even feel guilty for snapping at him. You seem angry, Victor commented as he joined him at the table he had hoarded in a corner of the library. What happened? Nothing, Draco sighed. I'm just a little tense, is all. There was a moment of pause in which Draco scanned the index of his book, looking for the chapter on how to identify the calls of magical creatures. Herbal... Dini, Victor started, as always struggling with the name. Hermione, Draco corrected absently. Yes, she told me Potter has a date for the ball, he continued. So he does, Draco said bitterly. Are you all right? Victor asked, watching him closely. Why wouldn't I be? Draco shrugged, not looking up. I'm not intending to go as it is. There was a moment of silence before Victor pressed on very carefully. I see the way you look at him, Draco. I know this is hard for you. What do you mean? Draco asked sharply. How do I look at him? Victor did not answer at first, seeming regretful to have spoken at all. Only at Draco's prodding did he continue very hesitantly. My friend Stoyan, he too, well... I mean, I might leave wrong. Sorry. I don't understand what you're saying, Draco insisted. It's just hard, Victor shrugged awkwardly. If a person you uh, care about deeply doesn't... But Harry cares about me? Draco blinked, genuinely confused. Yes, Victor said quickly. But not the same for you. When Draco still sat there utterly clueless about what the other boy was trying to do to tell him, Victor hastily got to his feet. Forget I said anything, he muttered. I am sorry. And with that, he fled the library, leaving Draco to stare after him, flabbergasted and slightly frightened. He could not get Victor's words out of his head for the rest of the week. It was like he had planted a seed that grew and grew to something inside of him, something with a stem and leaves that Draco could not yet identify. He found it hard to look at Harry. Everything hurt when he did, and Draco didn't understand why. It made no sense. Harry hadn't done anything. So why did Draco still feel like he was bleeding on the inside? He had to have a mind to ask Victor for clarification or even approach Hermione, but that would require him to own up to what was going on with him, and Draco didn't feel ready for that. Though he had no idea what exactly it was that was happening, it felt somehow shameful to him, like whatever he was feeling was something that shouldn't be there, and if anyone else knew what it was, they would judge him for it. It wasn't until Christmas Day when he opened Harry's present for him, a book on alchemy, which no doubt Hermione had suggested to him, that the loose ends started to slowly connect themselves to an uncomfortable truth. He spent the day out with his Gryffindor friends in the snow, trying not to think, not to feel, 
but every time he saw Harry's face flushed from the cold, an easy smile on his face, something squeezed it down on Draco's heart, and he found he couldn't breathe. No, he thought desperately. This couldn't be happening. Not to him. Not like this. Not Harry. But when Harry and Weasley parted with him as the clock struck seven, the realization had settled within Draco, and he knew that there was nothing he could do to undo it ever again. Are you sure you don't want to come? Harry asked quietly, frowning at Draco. It'll be boring without you. Quite sure. Draco nodded, his voice strained. He needed to get away. He needed to not look at Harry for another second. Have fun. I'll see you tomorrow. See you. Harry sighed in retaliation and followed Weasley up the stairs towards the Gryffindor Tower. Draco did his best to keep himself together as he made his way down to the dungeons. He knew better than to fall apart in public. If his upbringing had ever taught him anything, it was how to keep his composure. The Slytherin common room was buzzing with activity, students in dress robes waiting excitedly for their partners and younger students hanging around trying to get a glimpse of the event they were exempted from, and Draco pushed right through the crowd, eager to get to his dormitory. Sadly, it was far from empty. Each of his dorm mates was getting dressed for the ball, making a ruckus while at it, with the exclusion of Zabini, who was quiet as always. When Draco entered the room, not turned to him, his expression like a kneesel who had gotten the cream. Look, it's Malfoy, he boomed. Is it true you're not going away? Potter asked someone else, did he not? Trouble the paradise. Ant stung! Draco had prided himself in being mostly immune to Knott's taunt, but this one hit too close to home. Draco barely managed to glower at him. Smart of you, really. Not continued with a nasty snort. Pining after someone all night would be pathetic even for your standards, Malfoy. Better stay up in your room and cry your eyes out. Draco couldn't take it. He turned on his heels and left the room, the Slytherin quarters, the dungeons, walking and walking until he found himself in the Owlry. Aquila landed on his shoulder when he came to a halt, hooting loudly in greeting, but Draco could not bring himself to return anything. He couldn't speak. Tears were blurring his vision and he was trembling from head to toe. A sob escaped him and he dropped down on the bench near the window, burying his face in his hands. Aquila let out a softer hoot and nudged the side of his head with his beak. The sound of fluttering wings announced Hedwig's arrival. The snow owl landed next to Draco on his bench, an equally soft sound coming from her, but Draco could not reach for them, could not accept their comfort as his world was falling apart. Because he was in love with his best friend, who did not love him back.